Hello everyone and welcome to Archie Viking. Today is the fourth video in my Origins of Modern East Asia series. For today's video, we are looking at a region of East Asia that for much of its existence has been the loyal tributary or vassal area of the various Chinese empires, regardless of which kingdom ruled there at the time. Specifically, we are talking about the Joseon Dynasty, which was the little tributary kingdom of two different Chinese empires, the first being the Ming Dynasty and the second being the Qing Dynasty. However, the Joseon Dynasty was also a little unique because in contrast to, say, the Qing and Ming Dynasty and the, um, and the Tokugawa Shogunate and the Japanese Empire, it actually had a longer, it was actually more longer lasting uh, with the various Chinese and Japanese dynasties reigning anywhere between 100 to 250 years, whereas the Joseon dynasty actually uh, reigned for about 500 years, again, making it the longest lasting of these three kingdoms. So when we hear the name Korea, we immediately think of the modern equivalent, much in a similar way to Japan, Mongolia, and China, the three countries I talked about in the three previous videos in this series. Uh, and that is the two modern countries of North and South Korea. And this makes sense because for about 70 years, uh, give or take, this is how we've known Korea, the two Koreas. Uh, which were founded anywhere between 1950 to 1953, depending on whether you look at the beginning or the end of the Korean War. However, in order in order to get the bigger picture of how these countries came to being, we have to go back to their predecessor, the Joseon Dynasty. And before we go to the Joseon Dynasty, we of course have to look at its predecessor uh, as well. So. Uh, so the Joseon Dynasty's predecessor was the Goryeo Kingdom. Uh, and the Goryeo Kingdom existed at the same time of the rise of a different, much more powerful empire, the Mongol Empire, which was founded by the powerful Mongol Han or uh, chieftain uh, Chinggis Han, uh, the, in the early 1200 CEs, and the empire went and saw a relatively quick uh, rise uh, that saw it expand in every direction, eventually encompassing about 80-ish percent of the Eurasian continent. And of course, the, Kore the kingdom of Goryeo in Korea was no different. The kingdom of Goryeo uh, actually saw two different invasions by the Mongol Empire. The first being led by uh, Chinggis Khan's successor, his um, third, his uh, second youngest son, Ogede Han, uh, who ruled the Mongol Empire from 1229 to 1241 CE, and Ogede Han's uh, nephew, Mankei Han, who led an invasion of the Goryeo Kingdom um, and ruled the Mongol Empire from 1251 to 1259 CE. And in fact, Mahe Han was actually the one who finally conquered the Goryeo Kingdom. And here's the Goryeo Kingdom, uh, and you can see how deep the Mongol invasions got. Now, of course, this, this was not an easy conquest, necessarily. It did take uh, two or three invasions, um, but each invasion did see the Mongol army penetrate fairly deep into the Goryeo Kingdom, uh, with, of course, the final invasion by Mongkei Han being the final nail in the coffin. And so, with this, uh, the Goryeo Kingdom was now part of, to a point, the Mongol Empire. It was not an official part, though. It was, as I said uh, in the beginning, it was actually a tributary or vassal kingdom that was subservient to the Mongol Empire. Uh, and it was relatively loyal, actually, uh, for much of its history. However, this would eventually change with the founding of the Joseon Dynasty. So the Joseon Dynasty was founded 
shortly after the creation of the Ming Dynasty by the Hongwu Emperor, also known as uh, Zhu Yuanzhang, who was a at first a Chinese rebel leader who ousted the Mongol ruled Yuan dynasty from China and established his own dynasty, the Ming. And shortly after the founding of the Ming dynasty, actually the Goryeo dynasty, still to a certain degree loyal to the Mongol Empire, actually considered and even ordered various Korean generals to invade the Ming Dynasty on behalf of the Mongol Empire. However, several uh, Goryeo generals, for most of which was Yi Xiong, uh, Yi Xiong Yi, greatly disagreed with this for a variety of reasons. Uh, and this eventually led Yi Xiong Yi to initiate what is called a coup or a military revolt, where he slaughtered much of the uh, Goryeo bureaucracy and aristocracy and established himself as the ruler of the Korean Kingdom, establishing the Joseon Dynasty. However, it would take until the reign of the Yongle Emperor, who ruled the Ming Dynasty from 1402 to 1424 CE to for the Joseon Dynasty to be formally acknowledged as a tributary kingdom of the Ming Dynasty itself. Furthermore, uh, Yi Sun Yi's uh, reign as the king of the Joseon Dynasty would see pretty much immediately uh, political strife within his own bureaucracy. A uh, political strife that would become known as the strifes of the princes. And this is because, essentially, this political strife itself was a type of political strife that is relatively common in many empires throughout history. It was a inheritance dispute. And that's because uh, Yi Xiong Yi, known royally as the Taizhou king or Taizhou emperor of the Joseon dynasty, would nominate one of his sons, Zhang Zhang, as its successor. However, the various other brothers and sons of Taizhou, uh, Yi Xiong Yi, would take issue with this and would begin fighting amongst each other over the throne of the Joseon dynasty. Uh, there were many of the sons of Yi Xiong Yi, Taizhou Emperor, did this, but the two uh, primary aggressors were Zhang Zhang and his half brother Tai Zhang, with Tai Zhang eventually coming out on top because, as you see here, Zhang Zhang only ruled for two years before being ousted by his brother Tai Zhang. Uh, with Tai Zhang becoming officially the third emperor of the Joseon dynasty. Uh, and of course, as is obvious, um, at this point in time, the, with the ascendance of Taizong to the throne, the Joseon uh, political infrastructure and bureaucracy was incredibly unstable. <laughs> um, something of which Taizong was most certainly aware of, um, being that he was also partially responsible for that. So in order to fix this, Taizong created the State Council of Joseon, a bureaucratic and governmental body that was much more stable than the bureaucratic governmental bodies of the previous dynasties, such as the Goryeo and the Goryeo and etc., uh, which essentially revolved around um, the mostly superior authority of the Joseon king and his inner circle. Uh, meaning that Taizong was the first king to sort of make these steps into, uh, towards stabilizing the Joseon kingdom. However, he would not be the one who would finally accomplish this. This accomplishment would go to his successor and son, uh, the Sejong, uh, Sejong of Joseon, also known as uh, Sejong the Great, who would rule the Joseon kingdom from 1418 to 1450 CE. During the reign of Joseon, uh, of, of Sejong of Joseon, the Joseon kingdom would reach um, a golden age, not necessarily its height or the only golden age it would reach, but it would definitely reach a golden age. And Sejong would accomplish this first by uh, dealing with 
um, a major issue for both China and Joseon alike, the Wako pirates, which were pirates that are often characterized both in sources uh, at the time contemporary with Sejong, uh, as well as modern sources are often associated with uh, the, these pirates being Japanese, and while certainly there were Japanese uh, members of the Wako pirates, uh, they were mostly a multi-ethnic pirate group. But regardless of, whether, of their origins, they were still a massive issue. At the time of the reign of Sejong, raiding basically the entire coast of the Joseon uh, Kingdom, as well as the northern, nor, uh, northern, most eastern, uh, most northeastern part of the Ming Dynasty. So in response to these raids, uh, Sejong sent out a massive Korean Navy to deal with this. Uh, in fact, the Korean Navy was much better, uh, one much better trained, and also far better equipped, um, with their soldiers be, uh, being seen essentially like this, having oftentimes uh, either padded uh, armor or lamellar armor, and very skillfully made weapons, as well as their ships, which were far better and far, uh, one far better designed and far better armed than the Wako ships themselves, with the Wako pirates generally having on their ships only um, crossbows or uh, larger crossbows that one could call ballistas. They weren't called that in China or Korea, but that's essentially what they were. Uh, and make no mistake, the, the Korean ships, the Panoxons, definitely had these large crossbows ballistas on them, but what made the Korean Navy far more equipped and able to defeat these Wako pirates was the fact that the Panoxon were equipped with uh, with gunpowder weapons such as cannons, as well as, uh, as you can see here, ship-to-ship -ship rockets. We're not ship-to-ship -ship rockets, say, that were equivalent to the modern U.S. or British navies or anything like that, but definitely ship-to-ship uh, -ship rockets that were much more advanced than anything the Waco pirates had at their had on board. Uh, in fact, the Sejong Emperor, much like the Ming Dynasty, uh, were became very well aware that many of these Waco pirates, if not coming directly from, were at least being backed by uh, Japanese, the Japanese daimyo of Tsushima Island that you can see here. So Sejong the Great, would, after dealing with the Waco pirates, would actually personally send emissaries from the Joseon Kingdom to Tsushima Island itself, uh, that you can see here, uh, eventually negotiating uh, for, at least on paper, for the daimyo of the island of Tsushima to stop backing the Wako pirates. Uh, Sejong would also uh, oversee the building of a variety of forts and military outposts on the on Joseon's northernmost most border to deal with uh, both Mongol tribes uh, and warlords, as well as to deal with the Jurchen or Manchu tribes that would often raid into uh, Joseon territory as well, and making uh, the Joseon border far safer than it had been in previous reign in the reigns of his pre uh, in the reigns of his predecessors. In the reign of Sejong the Great. Hence, his moniker, the Great, would see uh, advances in a variety of different fields, uh, such as education, science, agriculture, and medicine. And it would also see the solidification of the social classes that would persist through most of the Joseon Kingdom's existence. Yeah. So during his reign, uh, the Joseon Dynasty developed a variety of new technologies. Uh, the um, self-striking water clock that you can see here, uh, rain gauges. They developed astronomical clocks, which were used for both telling time as well as for observing 
uh, as well as observing celestial phenomena like the the location of the sun, constellations, etc. Yeah, it improved. It witnessed, uh, it witnessed in the improvement to the printing press, which was an object that had been imported from China during the Tang Dynasty and the Mongol Dynasty, etc. Um, as well as it saw advancements in gunpowder weapons where the Joseon dynasty would import from uh, both the Mongol Empire, that was the Goryeo dynasty, but still uh, the Mongol Empire and the Ming dynasty would import from those gunpowder weapons such as cannons uh, and items known as hand cannons that were sort of predecessors to the musket, uh, as well as would import both uh, these items themselves, as well as their uh, schematics, which were various different kinds of rocket launchers, like you see here, uh, that would eventually be the inspiration for the Wacha rocket launcher used in the Korea Japanese invasions of Korea, also known as the M-I-M-J-I-N uh, war. Uh, Sejong's reign would also... Uh, be the reign that the Gong Nido map would be created, a map of the world as the Joseon dynasty knew it. And, you know, of course it's a little bit rudimentary, but you can sort of see uh, where he was going with it. Um, you know, here's Korea here, Japan over here, China over here, uh, India over here, etc., etc., you know, Russia and Mongolia over there. So, while it was relatively rudimentary, for the time, it was fairly expansive. There was also developments in agricultural techniques, as well as the creation of various agricultural manuals, such as the Explanations of Agriculture, which is, uh, you can pause to read this. This is a little description of the... Um, Agricultural man, uh, manual uh, explanations of uh, yeah explanations of agriculture that I just talked about here, uh, where essentially um, it copied uh, farming techniques from China uh, and combined them with traditional Korean agricultural practices uh, in order to improve uh, agriculture overall in the Korean Kingdom of Joseon, though it did have some issues as many of the agricultural techniques that they adopted were actually from uh, the northern region of China, <laughs> so uh, there were some limitations applying that to Korean climate and soil, but it still did allow for great improvement in uh, crop management as well as seed cultivation, etc., within the Joseon Kingdom. Which, of course, is, a, is an important thing because you have to feed your populace. Uh, is, and then, of course, there was also a, the creation of manuals of various different methods of medicine um, that were actually would be used by Europeans uh, what after contact with Europeans as well, um, such as the manual known as the Collection of Native Prescriptions for Saving Lives which helped uh, the Joseon life expectancy and quality of life uh, go up. And uh, during the Sejong's reign, and really the reigns of his predecessors as well, uh, the Joseon dynasty would adopt the Chinese institution of Confucianism, a philosophical, uh, a philosophical method uh, that involved around how to make a coherent and stable society. And of course, one of the best ways to implement these philosophical methods is with the creation of civil service examinations, much like the Chinese kingdoms going back to the Han Dynasty would implement. And during Sejong's reign, uh, the... Uh, it, Sorry, uh, Sejong's reign would be would witness the creation of the Guagyo civil service examinations, which helped in theory, or at least on paper, uh, uh, improve the amount and increase the amount of competent bureaucratic officials within the Joseon Kingdom. 
he would also create the Sung Kwon Yon, uh, Sung Yong Kwan, uh, apologies for possibly butchering that, educational academy, uh, essentially creating public education in the Joseon dynasty, uh, because this educational academy would not be the only one he created, it's just the most well known. Uh, during Sejong's reign, as I said, uh, there would be a solidification of the social pyramid within the Joseon kingdom, where essentially the king would be on the top, and then you would have various classes, uh, such as his inner circle, and the bureau bureaucrats, the Yongbon, and then the lower bureaucrats, the Chungnin, etc., uh, etc., et going down to the lowest class, the Chilmin. However, this was not a permanent class division. Because of his creation of education, uh, of his one of his public education and to his creation and utilization of the civil service examinations, it was possible, again, at least on paper, for the social classes, the lowest class, to rise up to the young bond position, the higher ranking bureaucratic positions via getting a public education and eventually and eventually taking the uh the civil service examinations uh sejong's reign would also uh, be a golden age for the various types of arts with new instruments being created such as the pyongyang uh again apologies for possibly butchering that and would witness the creation of many very beautiful pieces of artwork, such as this mountain scenery scene that you see here. Uh, and true to their, uh, their love of the Ming Dynasty and their copying of various Chinese uh, uh, medicines, technologies, etc., the Joseon Dynasty would copy Ming Dynasty uh, ceramic methods in order to create their own versions of porcelain that you can see here. Uh, types of porcelain that would be very sought after by European traders, much like Chinese porcelains would be. And th to me, the most fascinating and uh, I think the best thing about the Sejong, uh, Sejong the Great is the fact that he actually created uh, and implemented maternity leave for women in the Joseon dynasty, mainly women of lower ranks, be they peasants or or slaves or indentured servants or what have you, but regardless of class, he implemented a maternity leave that at first was over 100 days of maternity leave, but he actually increased that later on, adding an, an extra 30 days before their birth. Uh, so in, in other words, 30 days of maternity leave before the child's birth and another 100 after the child is born. So making 130 days of maternity leave, which is actually the first time I have come across this in East Asia, at least. Um, there may be more countries that have done this, but this is the first time I have personally come across this. And I think this is just fascinating. Unfortunately, shortly after Sejong the Great's death, the Joseon dynasty would again witness uh, some degree of political strife. And this happened because Sejong's successor, Munjong of Joseon, would, eventually, would actually only rule for about two years from 1450 to 1452 CE before dying, uh, with his throne being inherited by his son, Dongzhong of Joseon, who also would only rule for uh, actually three years from 1452 to 1455 CE before being deposed and removed from his throne by his uncle, who declared himself Seijo of Jiosin, ruling from 1455 to 1468 CE. And actually, during Seijo's early reign, uh, six ministers loyal to the Dongzhong, uh, to Dongzhong, uh, would attempt to assassinate Seijo, only for the assassination to fail. Seijo survived the assassination attempt, and it would actually end in the execution of these ministers, 
in the permanent dead position and actually eventual execution of Dong Zhang. However, despite that, uh, the, the reign of Seizhou and his successor were reigns of relative stability in, that witnessed um, increased stability for the Kingdom of Joseon, as well as um, several reforms being passed. However, uh, much in a similar way to uh, Sejong the Great and his grandfather, uh, Yi Song-gi, uh, this would not last, because during the reign of... Uh, it would actually be... political strife would actually increase during the reign of the uh, Yong Song-un of Joseon, who reigned uh, from 1495 to 1506 CE. And this is because uh, Yoon Song Un was a notorious tyrant, and he gained this reputation because he initiated, well, for a variety of things, but one of the most famous things he did was initiating several brutal purges of the Joseon literati, killing hundreds, if not thousands, of the Joseon literati. Um, and really just <laughs> ruling the Joseon dynasty with an iron fist um, and causing more political turmoil. In fact, his reign would be the beginning of what is known as the Middle Joseon period, which cover, which is a period of the Joseon dynasty that covers roughly 1495 to 1637 CE. And this is because during uh, Yun Song Un's reign and his succeeding uh, kings in the succeeding kings of the Joseon dynasty, uh, the political bureau uh, the bureaucracy of the Joseon dynasty would witness the rise of two major political parties that hated each other and were actually uh, interfered with each other, making any kind of changes to the Joseon dynasty. Uh, and that would be the Western factions and the Eastern factions that themselves would eventually, and we'll talk about this again later in the video, divide into their own sub-factions uh, that you can see here. But uh, again, we'll talk about these later subdivisions later, but what's important is that these two political factions greatly destabilized the bureaucracy and central government of the Kingdom of Joseph. Uh, and this would actually be one of, not the only, but one of the key reasons why Korea, the Joseon Dynasty of Korea, did so terribly in uh, the Toitomi's invasions of Korea, the Japanese invasions of Korea in the 1590s. So in 1592, in an attempt to take control of the East Asian uh, trade networks, as well as an attempt to install himself as the ruler of main China, the Japanese warlord Toitomi Hideyoshi would initiate an invasion of uh, Joseon Korea in an attempt to get to Ming Dynasty China. And at first, he tr attempted to negotiate with Joseon Korea asking them to just essentially let his army march through unimpeded to the Ming Dynasty. However, um, one, uh, the Joseon Dynasty was a loyal tributary vassal state to the Ming Dynasty. In fact, the Joseon bureaucracy and the Joseon Dynasty as a whole was proud of being a tributary state, uh, essentially a younger brother state to the Ming Dynasty. But it wasn't just that. It was also the fact that the various rival, the two rival factions impeded each other from making any kind of clear decisions, whether it be uh, decisions to fully negotiate with Toyotomi Hideyoshi and spare them from the invasion. Uh, and they, the, uh, one party impeded the other party's decision of warning the Ming Dynasty and calling for help. Uh, they impeded each other's attempts to improve the Joseon military and strengthen coastal defenses. Basically anything that could have prevented 
or could have lessened the damage of the Japanese invasions was impeded by this political strife. And so in response to the refusal of the Joseon dynasty to side with him and the fact that this political strife uh, hampered and actually made negotiations with uh, the Toitomi's Japanese kingdom worse, Toitomi Hideyoshi decided to invade Korea, the Joseon kingdom in 1592 with a massive fleet and army of around 150,000 soldiers. Uh, putting in, in overall command of the invasion his two best and most trusted generals, Konishi Yukonaga and Kato Kiyomasa. So, right off the bat, we have to look at sort of the difference in uh, Japanese military garb and Joseon military garb. So, for one, for one thing, the elite soldiers of the Japanese army are famously the samurai who would wear the very heavy armor well sorry the very robust armor heavy armor is a misnomer because oftentimes the armor wouldn't actually be that heavy uh very robust armor uh and would be known for their for their skills in battle uh being skilled tacticians skilled masters of Weapons like the katana and the yari spear, and of course the yumi bow, and they would actually be very skilled horse archers. However, uh, at this time, the Japanese military would consist predominantly of the what uh, the military unit known as the ashigaru, which were peasant soldiers who fought most of the time in line formations with spears. Uh, as well as inline formations with arquebuses, um, muskets. Uh, weapons that the Joseon dynasty themselves had, but they had far less of and far less quality, not, not as good quality muskets as the Japanese military did. In fact, uh, Toitomi Hideyoshi's uh, military, uh, his, his musketeers, his arquebusiers, were, were, were mentioned in uh, all three sources Japanese, uh, Korean, and Chinese sources as being incredibly skilled at what they did. In contrast, the Korean military had elite generals who wore uh, either um, studded, uh, essentially brigantine armor, which is uh, leather armor with metal plates on the inside, uh, which is actually where these studs come from. Studded leather is a myth. It's not actually studded leather. It's just metal plates that are hidden. Uh, or lamellar armor, which is metal armor with metal plates that overlap sort of like this, or say like uh, sort of like this, or anything you can imagine. Uh, and they would be armed with um, broadsword spears and recurved composite bows that actually, again, according to all three sources, were the best bows. So rather than the, uh, if we go back up to the Japanese samurai, rather than the Yumi bow that the samurai were known for, the Korean re uh, the Korean recurve bow and the Mongolian recurve bow, which is where the Korean military got it from, was a far better and far more powerful and far more useful bow than the Yumi bow. I mean, to a point. I mean, they were both very skilled and oftentimes the Korean and Chinese and Mongol sources um, talk about and admired the Japanese forces for their skill with the bow. Uh, but still, overall, the composite bow was the better bow. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, lower classes, the general makeup of the Korean military, were very similar to the Ashigaru, just peasant soldiers who had padded uh, fabric or leather armor, wore felt hats, and had spears. Uh, and here is uh, the composite bow, the recurve bow that the Korean military, the Joseon military, would generally have. Uh, and here are their broad swords that sometimes look very similar to the katana, but were often not quite the same, though maybe sometimes inspired by it. Uh, but generally more inspired by the Chinese Dao or broadsword. And of course, uh, one of their most effective weapons during this the Japanese invasions of 
uh, of Korea w- were the Hwacha rocket launchers, which the Joseon military used to great effect against uh, the Japanese brigades and armies. Uh, essentially, the Wacha was, as, as I just described, a rocket launcher where you would have hundreds of arrows uh, in these little holes here with rockets attached to them, which you can see up here. So we would fire them, and it would just be a sea of arrows. Now imagine ten of these, or even three of these, on the battlefield. It would be devastating. And uh, the Korean, so the Joseon Kingdom actually had better cannons than the uh, than the Japanese army. So in contrast to the Japanese army having the better muskets, uh, the Korean and eventually Ming Chinese armies that would come uh, a year later would have the better cannons and the better artillery. Uh, one thing that was that can be attributed to the Joseon Dynasty's survival during this period, because while the Joseon Dynasty did overall badly in the first couple of years of the uh, in the M Gen I M J I N War, uh, not engine. I, I still want to make that distinction because uh, <clears throat> uh, while they did badly in that first couple of years, they were still able to survive and hold out until the Ming Dynasty intervened. And this was for because of a, a variety of factors, but uh, the two one of the primary factors was uh, guerrilla warfare groups or uh, rebel groups who, um, or sorry, not rebel groups, um, uh, small military units who would uh, implement uh, raids and guerrilla warfare on the Japanese forces, uh, led by Buddhist monks, uh, such as the warrior monks. Uh, Hu Zhong and Yong Yu, both of which ro- it created uh, and raised several uh, the, several small uh, military groups, several small militia groups of Buddhist monks to fight for the Joseon Dynasty. Generally, just to gain favor, because at this point in time, Buddhism was sort of I don't want to say being persecuted, but it was definitely not in very high favor in the Joseon dynasty, and so they wanted the favor that they had previously had in the early Joseon dynasty and the Goryeo dynasty back. But regardless of their motives, they still fought for the Joseon dynasty and fought to great effect, though uh, Hu Jiang would eventually die in battle alongside other Korean uh, militias, um, really because the leader of the said Korean militia uh, was um, a little bit arrogant and cocky and got cornered and refused to surrender. And so Hu Zhang was like, well, I saw I fought I'm alongside him. I might as well follow him into death. Um, but he, he, because of that action, he became a martyr, which also brought more uh, militia groups into the fold. And then other militia groups were created by individuals such as Guok Jeu and Gim Si Min, uh, both of which were uh, were Joseon generals. And together they gathered up the uh, the peasant populace and the scattered military populace of Joseon, uh, with the military populace having been scattered into the winds by the onslaught of the for the most part, of the Japanese army. Uh, so this meant that these individuals had to gather them back together alongside peasant uh, groups, peasant militia groups, and with this they created groups known as the Righteous Armies. Of And much like the warrior monks led by Hyo Zhang, uh, they implemented and conducted several, quite a few actually, successful guerrilla warfare raids against the now uh, divided Japanese military. Because, of course, the Japanese military, once gaining a foothold, began to split off to go after different military objectives, greatly weakening (laughs) the Japanese military overall. And in fact, uh, 
the, and here's here's some of the uh, righteous military, the monk armies and the uh, peasant armies. And in fact, but as I said, in fact, the Wok Jeu and Yim Jin actually were even able to successfully fend off uh, a large scale Japanese siege at the fortress of Jinju in 1592 with uh with Gim Sin uh, with um Gim Sin uh, not Gim Sin sorry with yeah Gim Si Min with Gim Si Min using weapons like the Wacha to great effect to hold off the Japanese forces. And then when he was essentially about when, when he was looking like he was about to lose the battle, Guac Jiu rode in with three thousand uh, militiamen in his of his righteous army, uh, and through a combination of flanking maneuvers as well as psychological warfare, he lit he blew had his forces blow several war horns and light uh, several extra fires to make his army look larger. He, they together with Gimsi Min were able to push back the Japanese forces from Jinju Fortress and win the day. Though it should also be noted that in 1593, Japanese forces under the leadership of generals such as Ukite Hidie uh, would come with even more soldiers to uh, Jinju Fortress and would eventually take the fortress, uh, resulting in the death of Gimsi Men. Actually, Gimsi Men died first, uh, and his death demoralized the Joseon military in the fort and led to the taking of the fort. But it's that's a little bit of apple and oranges there. But regardless of his death, he, like Wak Jeyu, would become uh, renowned as heroes for their fight and their successes against the Japanese military. Uh, but it wouldn't be just these uh, these infantry forces that would make a great uh, impact on the uh, the Joseon survival in the in this war. Uh, the, the, another well known hero of this war was the uh, was Admiral Yi Sun Sin, who uh, gathered what was left of the Korean Navy, because essentially what happened is when the Japanese military came, a lot of the admirals of the various ports and, mil and naval bases were inexperienced in naval warfare, and so they feared the Japanese military and actually destroyed their own naval ships, ships that probably could have, uh, well, sorry, most definitely could have actually decimated the Japanese fleet. And the reason I say most definitely could have is because only two of the two only two admirals who didn't destroy their fleets, Yi Sun Sin um, was actually the most successful and he proved how easily this could have been done. It was because one, he ambushed several Japanese fleets and decimated them to great success. But two, he developed a new battleship. So the earlier battleships were the Panak Song that I mentioned earlier in reference to the destruction of the Wako pirates. Uh, Yi Sun Sin built a new one called the Tonic Song, or the uh, turtle ship, which as you can see here is a, and this is not to scale, but um, is a battleship that consists of two decks, uh, rowers on the bottom, and the top deck with cannons uh, that also had a roof with uh, iron plates and iron spikes on top for protection um, and a turtle, a dragon's head, sort of like a dragon turtle, that actually would have a flamethrower coming out. Because yes, flamethrowers did exist at the time, though they weren't quite as powerful as, say, modern flamethrowers. And so this allowed Yi Sun Sin and his fleet to get in between Japanese uh, naval formations and just rip the Japanese Navy to shreds. Uh, and he did this to great effect, actually de destroying several hundred Japanese warships, greatly weakening uh, the Japanese fleet. And all of this combined, the righteous armies, the warrior monks, uh, as well as the guerrilla attacks against the Japanese military, 
and, and along with Yi Sun Sin's uh, naval victories, would allow the Joseon Kingdom to survive long enough for Ming China to send in uh, military reinforcements led by Li Ru Song. And together with Li Ru Song and, and his brothers, uh, many of his brothers were also generals, but they were lower ranking than he was, uh, they would actually be able to uh, force back the Japanese military after a long, hard-fought war. This was not an easily fought war, even with the Ming Dynasty's might behind the Joseon Dynasty, because uh, the Japanese military was one of the best militaries at the time, uh, alongside the Japanese, the Chinese military, which was probably a little bit better, but not that much better. Uh, but eventually... The Joseon Dynasty and the Ming Dynasty would be able to defeat Toitomi Hideyoshi's forces in 1598, uh, forcing the Japanese to return to Japan, and J Korea would not witness another Japanese invasion for another, yeah, another 400 years, three to 400 years. However, uh, the in the this invasion, the M Jin War, uh, would actually weaken the Joseon Dynasty greatly, allowing for uh, in only about twenty years, twenty or so years, thirty years, uh, allowing another military group to successfully invade and conquer for, uh, the Joseon Dynasty, and that would be the Manchu Dynasty or the Qing Dynasty. Uh, really, the earlier Jin Dynasty is what it was called at this point in time, uh, but for, for the sake of the argument, we'll call it the Qing Dynasty. Uh, and this invasion was initiated by an individual who actually fought on the side of the Joseon Dynasty, at least to some degree, uh, the uh, Jurchen or Manchu warlord and eventually king, uh, Nurhachi, or seen over here on the left. Uh, and the to be so first of all, let's explain what the Manchu military, the Qing military, ma was made up of. So at this point in time, the Qing military was made up generally of nomadic horse archers of both Mongolian and Jurchen descent that, like you can see here, uh, that made great use of the composite bow. And at this point in time, the the Eastern Jin Dynasty or the Qing Dynasty would actually be the uh, only nation that had not been greatly affected by the Japanese invasions of Korea. Um, in fact, the other four areas of East Asia, Mongolia, uh, China, the Joseon Dynasty of Korea, and Japan, all saw some degree of either weakness or political change thanks to the Japanese invasions of Korea. Not so much with the uh, Jurchen slash Manchus uh, under uh, Nurhachi. And so because of this, Nurhachi had a powerful veteran military who was experienced in fighting uh, the Mongolians, the Chinese, the Japanese, and the Koreans, uh, and uh, this army was relatively untouched. And so because of this, this allowed him to eventually conquer the whole region, including the Joseon dynasty. And it took it took a little while, much like the Mongol Empire. It took uh, a couple of a couple of different invasions. Uh, the first being in 1627, uh, and the second one uh, in, in, with the 1627 invasion only getting about halfway through the Joseon Kingdom. Uh, with the last invasions in 1636 from 1637 finally ending in the conquest of the Joseon Dynasty by the Qing Dynasty. Uh, and here's a map of the Qing ruling area. And again, like under the Mongol Empire uh, and the Ming Dynasty, um, while the Qing Dynasty conquered the uh, while the Qing Dynasty conquered uh, the Joseon Dynasty, they rather than making them a permanent part of their empire, the Qing Dynasty turned the Joseon Dynasty into a tributary state, a vassal state. So, i.e., the Joseon Dynasty kept its nominal independence, its nominal, it, it, the Joseon kings still ruled the Joseon Dynasty, but they answered to the Manchu rulers of the Qing Dynasty.
However, despite this renaissance uh, and this stability brought on by uh, Hyung Jong and his successors like Zhang Zhou, um, the political division would not go away. <clears throat> In fact, it would get worse because the what was originally two different factions, the Western faction and the Eastern faction, would divide into new factions. So the Western faction would divide into the Southern faction, and the Eastern faction would eventually become known as the Northern faction, with the Northern faction itself dividing into the Old Learning and Young Learning factions, with the Young Learning factions, uh, faction itself, dividing into two sub-factions called the Hardliners and the Softliners, essentially making the Joseon bureaucracy more unstable than ever. Nothing illustrates this fact better than the succession of various queen dowagers who would take the throne and backstab from each other or who would die, say, of old age or what have you that happened within a 50-year span. Uh, with the queen dowager who really sort of initiated this set of dominoes falling, who was the first domino who caused it to fall, if you will, being Queen Jong's son, who one would only rule for five years, uh, and two would be the Joseon ruler who would initiate the uh, Joseon policy of persecuting Christians, uh, European Christians, really Christians overall, who lived in the Joseon dynasty, specifically Catholics. However, it is also important to note that despite the the in yeah, the despite the instability created by the massive division of the what was originally just two factions into uh, six different factions, as well as the um, instability created by Queen Jong Sung, uh, yeah, Jong Sung, um, the a Joseon court official Kim Jo Sun would actually. Uh, work, at least start the steps towards some degree of stability in the Joseon dynasty again. Uh, Kim Joseon lived from 1765 to 1832 CE, uh, being a court official for much of his life, and he was able to gain control of most of the Joseon court uh, and eventually paved the way for his own daughter becoming the queen of the Joseon dynasty herself, Queen Sun Wan. With Queen Sun Wan ruling for 18 from 1834 to 1857 CE. However, despite this stability that was brought by uh, that was brought by Kim Jo Sun and his daughter Queen Sun Wan. Uh, the Joseon dynasty would eventually decline and come to its end. Sort of. Uh, and this would happen during the reign of Go Jong of Joseon, who ruled the Joseon dynasty from 1864 to 1897 CE. And his reign would be would have both its rises would both uh, would both have uh, have both its ups and its downs. So first, its ups he uh, initiated the restoration of various uh, buildings and areas within the capital, such as the restoration of the the Gyeongbok Palace, uh, and he also oversaw the defeat of the Second French Empire, um, <clears throat> when the Second French Empire, uh, which you can see here on the left, uh, attempted to invade the Joseon dynasty in response to the persecution of Catholics by the Joseon dynasty. However, <clears throat> the Joseon dynasty was able to uh, hold out and inflict oh, excuse me, large-scale casualties on the French military forcing the French military to flee and retreat, and therefore uh, leading to the expedition failing on the part of the French. However, uh, uh, this would not go so well when the Joseon dynasty came up against the U.S., though the U.S. expedition itself would also be a failure. 
Uh, so the U.S. expedition to Korea occurred in 1871 CE. Uh, and this happened because <clears throat> essentially the United States had already earlier attempted to copy the British and the French who had um, essentially used what is called gunboat diplomacy or military diplomacy to force open China and other Southeastern, Southeast Asian countries to trade with European powers. So the U.S., attempted to copy this one by going to uh, Japan and forcing Japan to open itself to trade with the West, which it was semi-successful. Uh, and then they tried to copy it again by doing the same with Korea, with the Joseon dynasty. So first, the, they, the U.S. forces, U.S. Uh, Navy forces actually attempted to smuggle Joseon trade goods out of the Joseon dynasty. However, the Joseon navy uh, caught the ship in question and destroyed it. So in response to this, uh, this attack, this threat to U.S. military, uh, to the, this threat to U.S. power, quote-unquote, which of course wasn't really, uh, the U.S. government sent a fleet of ships to essentially attempt to do to the Joseon dynasty what they did to Japan. Um, and here's a picture of the U.S. government sending out the orders and the U.S. forces on the ship on their way to Korea. And once there, the U.S. fleet uh, sailed up the uh, Ganghua uh, Basin and defeated uh, several Joseon military bases, uh, inflicting large-scale casualties on uh, the Joseon military. However, uh, this really didn't bait uh, the Joseon dynasty at all. The Joseon dynasty essentially was just like, eh, whatever, and ignored them. And so the U.S., despite winning their battles, despite defeating the Joseon dynasty and all uh, CR1 to three, four, uh, five, etc. engagements, the Joseon dynasty didn't care, and so the U.S. was forced to leave. Uh, however, five years later, a different imperial power would actually succeed, and where in uh, succeed where uh, France and the U.S. failed, in an event known as the Treaty of Congo, and this. Uh, imperial power was the uh, Japanese Empire, or the Empire of Japan, as you can see here. And so, uh, eventually, with the Japanese Empire's rise and the consolidation of Japanese imperial power after the overthrow of the Tokugawa shogunate, the Japanese Navy would be spotted off of uh, the island of Gongwa, uh and would, the Japanese Navy would force the Joseon government, sorry, the Joseon dynasty to sign the Treaty of Ganghua, um, forcing the uh, Joseon dynasty to give Ganghua to, at least temporarily, to the Japanese Empire, as well as forcing the Joseon dynasty to open several ports to uh, the Japanese Empire and allow the Japanese Empire to have warehouses or um, trade areas within these ports. And of course, the Japanese Empire, after doing this, installed at Gongwa Island and various other the various other ports and bases that they established in these ports that they forced the Joseon dynasty to open up to Japan, the Japanese military installed several military bases that were heavily armed with weapons like uh, you can't see them very well in this picture, but Gatlin guns is what these are. Which, of course, made it incredibly difficult for the Joseon military to uh, oust the, the Japanese, the Joseon military to oust the Japanese imperial military at all. Uh, but despite the power of the Japanese military, um, and actually probably because of the influence and power of the Japanese military, the Joseon Korean populace would be angered by the Japanese presence. 
prisons, and this led to a variety of riots and rebellions, the first of which being the Emo Incident. So the Emo Incident, or the Emo Riot, was a riot in response to uh, the lack of, I don't want to say lack of funding, but that's essentially what it is, but uh, essentially Joseon military commanders and military bases uh, were, essentially Joseon soldiers were not being paid uh because the Japanese Empire was had a monopoly on the Joseon's economy thanks to the trade and they were able to essentially hamper and stop the payments from the Joseon government to their military. And so in response to them not being paid, Joseon soldiers rioted in large scale numbers. Um in various areas, especially areas controlled by the Japanese. And so in response to this, the Japanese Empire and the Qing Dynasty, both at the request of the Joseon government itself, sent in military units, uh, this is the Japanese Empire's army right here, and the Qing Dynasty's army right here, sent in military units to put down these riots, which of course they did with great brutality. I mean, look at the Chinese army right here. They have a Gatling gun. One can only imagine the devastation that that caused, let alone all the Gatling guns and artillery, etc., held by the Japanese Empire. <clears throat> but that would not be the end of it. In fact, it would be the beginning. Uh, because only 10 years later, well, sorry, only 12 years later, an even bigger event happened. The Don Hawk Peasant Revolution, which itself led into the First Sino-Japanese War. So, in 1894, a Joseon commander, uh, Joe Bongjon, angered at the presence of the Japanese and their increasing influence and, in, and the increasing uh, inequalities that the Japanese Empire's influence had on the, 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 the Japanese Empire was causing in the Joseon Kingdom. Uh, in response to these, John Bongjong uh, wrote, gathered up militias and various Joseon military brigades uh, and started the Dong Hawk Peasant Revolution. And it was also not in response to the corruption of the Joseon government, which of course was getting nice fat checks <laughs> from the Japanese Empire. So in response to this, the jo uh, Joseon dynasty asked their, uh, asked their patron the Qing, uh, the Qing Empire for help. And so in response, the Qing Empire sent 5,000 soldiers into the Joseon Dynasty to put down this rebellion. Unfortunately for uh, the Joseon Dynasty, um, the, the Japanese Empire saw the presence of the Qing Dynasty's empire as a threat. So in response to this, the Japanese Empire sent 5,000 soldiers from the Japanese military into the Joseon Dynasty uh, as well. And this in itself angered the Qing Dynasty, and so... Uh, the two these two belligerent parties, the Japanese Empire and the Qing Dynasty, uh, instead of fighting the Peasant Rebellion, actually started fighting each other. Uh, though, to be fair, the Peasant Rebellion had already been put down by the Qing Dynasty, but they started fighting each other. And in fact, the Japanese army uh, took uh, Seoul, the capital of the Joseon Dynasty, and deposed the current Joseon King, uh, and put temporarily put a pro Japanese emperor in charge, though eventually um, the previous Joseon king would be reinstated. And so, with this, the first Sino Japanese war had begun, and it saw heavy fighting, with which was actually ended up in a one sided war, uh, with Japan being far better equipped, uh, because. For one thing, what China had at this point had 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 some successes against European powers like the French, 
uh, but it also had had some failures. And it, in, in, in spite of uh, the Qing dynasty attempting to modernize itself, corruption within the Qing dynasty itself, as well as um, hampering of this modernization by European and American powers, uh, imperialism, had led to the Qing dynasty to be far <laughs> less equipped than the Japanese empire, leading uh, Japanese fleets to be woefully underclassed as in comparison to the Japanese fleet. Uh, you can see a Chinese ship having been destroyed here. Um, here's another example of <laughs> Japanese naval navy uh, destroying Chinese ships. And the Chinese and the Japanese Imperial Army was uh, far better trained as well as far better equipped it's as well. And so they were able to fairly easily defeat the Chinese military. And so with this, the uh, Sino-Japanese War ended in the Japanese victory, um, forcing China to sign the Treaty of Shimonoseki, which opened uh, uh, Port Arthur to trade with uh, the Japanese Empire and as well as gave Taiwan, a Chinese um, island, to the Japanese Empire. And also officially ending the Chinese hegemony over uh, the Joseon dynasty. In fact, as a result of this uh, of this war, Korea, the Joseon dynasty, actually gained independence, permanent independence, from the Qing dynasty and from China as a whole and led to the creation of the Korean Empire in 1897 CE, which you can see here. All right, so that that is the end of our video. Um, and that's the history of how uh, Korea began to transition into the modern age. So I hope you enjoyed the video, uh, and if you want me to cover any of the other subjects I mentioned in the video in greater depth, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section, uh, and remember to like, share, and subscribe. I hope you all have a good day. However, despite being conquered and made a tributary state to the Qing Dynasty, the late Joseon period uh, a period of time encompassing roughly 1649 to 1897 CE would at least for a time witness the coming of a second golden age or a second re uh, renaissance of uh, ideas, uh, of new reforms and ideas in the Joseon dynasty. And these new reforms, this new golden age, would be initiated by uh, King Hyongjong of Joseon, who ruled the Joseon dynasty from 1659 to 1674 CE, and Kim Yuk, uh, his court official, who lived roughly from either 1570 or 1580 CE to 1658 CE. And together they would uh, implement the Silhok reforms, which were Neo-Confucian reforms created uh, mainly by Kim Yuk, uh, in response to other earlier Neo Confucian reforms that were uh, more metaphysical and supernatural in their leanings, something of which Kim Yuk uh, seems to have disagreed with. And so, in response, he created the Sohak social reforms, which were far more pragmatic. And actually, these reforms helped stabilize the Joseon uh, dynasty overall and proved beneficial to both court officials and peasants alike. Um, so it made over the overall populace of the Joseon dynasty far happier. Now, of course, um, as is the pattern with the Joseon dynasty, factional disputes and factional rivalries between the uh, Western and Eastern factions and their eventual subsets did continue. However, the reigns of uh, Yongzhou, uh, who ruled the Joseon dynasty 
uh, from 1724 to 1776 CE, and Zhang Zhou, who ruled the Joseon Dynasty of 1776 to 1800 CE, would witness, uh, one, it would witness uh, at least nominal balance, uh, thanks to the efforts of both of these kings, between the various political factions, and would actually increase the uh, New, would actually further the gold, the new golden age uh, of the Joseon Dynasty started by uh, Hyeongjong, um, yeah, Hyeongjong of Joseon. In fact, uh, uh, in fact, Yongjo and Jongjo would to, would together over the course of their reigns uh, build and improve various fortresses such as the Hwaseong Fortress. And would uh, Zhangzhou specifically would create uh, various libraries such as the Kyungjok Library, um, which was the as, as you can see in the picture a symbol and center of the late Joseon Renaissance, greatly improving the education and learning within the Joseon Dynasty itself. <laughs> 